Welcome to the Spinner Rack with your hosts, Brian and Junior. Welcome back to the Spinner Rack. This is your host, Big B, Brian Adams. Issue 40 this week, we got a special guest, Gilbert Deltres, creator of Under the Flesh. How are you doing today, Gilbert? Big B, so far doing good. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure, man. It's a pleasure. Give us a little background on you outside of uh, Under the Flesh. Uh, how did you get started uh, writing comics? Have uh, you been writing since you were young, or is this something you just decided to do recently? Uh, I guess as a kid, always having imagination, always comics. Just uh, never thought I could write comics. I guess I was part of that group that was just enjoyed the fun, enjoyed the escape, enjoyed the adventure, and never really knew I could write. It was only until uh, schooling, film, I was with the film and stuff like that, and basically I figured, but why don't I try my hand at comics? I wrote screenplays, I I wrote poetry, I said, let me try comics, because the love was there, and the imagination was there, and I started with Under the Flesh, uh, because I always loved the post-apocalyptic genre. <laughs> Something about the end of the world or zombies always seemed uh, fun, so I figured, let me start there. And Under the Flesh was kind of born, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a great place to start. Uh, the zombie genre is really popular. Uh, for people that haven't read Under the Flesh yet, I liked it. I felt it was a good mix of almost like, you've kind of got a little Walking Dead in there, obviously. And then it's kind of smashed with a little bit of Why the Last Man. With, uh, Definitely. I, I don't know how you're going to feel about this comparison or if you've heard it before, but I kind of feel there's a little bit of Captain America squash in there. <laughs> <laughs> Zombies, let me tell you, first, first of all, like, the genre, I think there's a lot of mileage left in the zombie genre. I mean, you can always spin zombies in so many different ways because you have them revived by voodoo, the whole virus. With Under the Flesh, I feel I wanted to tackle on the zombie genre, but kind of evolve it in a way, and which is why they're not typically undead. It's like a virus that just debilitates the... Uh, cerebral functions of man just basically basically hyper stimulating like primal impulses really um the, the savagery the, the, the cannibalistic impulse uh, to, to uh even I, I even had I touch on some elements with, with the with the rape I know it's not typically zombie rape but it's just the fact that they're, it's taking the primal it's bringing the primal into man and I felt under the flesh I could explore these areas and I figured what's another way to to kind of evolve the genre. And when he talked about Captain America, I figured to see a superhero in a post-apocalyptic setting where he kind of has these powers, but at the same time, in a post-apocalyptic setting, when being surrounded by death, by chaos, especially with a virus that only affects males, that means you're going to be against overwhelming odds, so you will be in a position where you can't save everybody. And I just thought that was an interesting dynamic to have in, in a zombie, I guess you could say, a zombie genre. So what would you say that was your main inspiration for Under the Flesh? Oh, for sure. Definitely, without a doubt, to Romero, Lucio Fulci, at the Dawn of the Dead, the Day of the Dead. Some reason that I bonded big time with the zombie genre at the kid. I was fascinated by horror. Uh, I don't know where that came from growing up in a Christian household, but I was just drawn to, to the horror. Resident Evil video game was also a big inspiration. Uh, what he did, that, that, that caught me. That, it, like, entranced me as well. As well as Robert Kirkman, The Walking Dead. Being a, a fan of comics, and we, it was never really a zombie comic, and when The Walking Dead first came out, I was instantly hooked. Interestingly so, how you, how you bring up Why the Last Man. Brian K. Vaughan is an awesome author, no doubt. And I kind of got into Why the Last Man late. I actually wasn't in, like, I didn't catch on when it was just hitting. And I had a friend tell me about Why the Last Man. They said to check it out. And we checked it out. I read all the book completely. I kind of liked his direction. I kind of liked what he did. And it's kind of interesting how when I created Under the Flesh, there's a, there's a similarity. I'm like, I'm just going to say that and that a virus only affecting men, so to speak. But all these were, were little inspirations to, to create Under the Flesh, but also try to evolve the post-apocalyptic zombie genre in a way where we can give the fans and readers that big zombies that are into zombies something fresh. And then I'm all about trying to bring something fresh to the, to the genre. Very cool. It's definitely a different take than anything I've seen before, personally. Uh, I, too, am a huge zombie fan. You mentioned Romero, Fellucci. I love zombie. 
Definitely. The shark fight with the zombie, that was awesome. It's oh, classic. Oh, my God. I still, to this day, don't know how they filmed that. Maybe that's something I should Google. But that's a, that's a scene that is just captivating just to see a shark and a zombie in the same screen at once. And me, of course, being a zombie fan, but I was also, as a child, had a big fascination with sharks. I was in the library checking out shark books and, and whatnot. And just to see the zombie and the shark share the, share the same screen. It's amazing and how they filmed that was incredible. And like, Fuji was definitely an innovator in horror, and I love that. It's a classic. If you've ever yeah, seen absolutely. Zombie and you're a fan of zombies, you're doing yourself a disservice by not seeing that movie. <laughs> definitely, I agree. Definitely, or not rewatch it because it's definitely worth it. Even Shinji Mikami, the creator of Resident Evil, said that a big inspiration for Resident Evil was that movie, Zombie by Lucio Fulci. So, really do yourself a check it out because you'll see some striking resemblances between some of the zombies there that are featured in Resident Evil 1. You kind of see the, the design, so to speak, on uh, how got their inspiration from, but definitely that's an awesome zombie movie, one of my favorites. Now, like a lot of the zombie movies, you really aren't given a reason for the uh, apocalypse that's happened or the, the disease or whatever it is that's making people zombies. You decided to go straight out and say it was it was chemical warfare or, or a chemical attack. What made you decide just to straight out of the gate be like, boom, it was a chemical attack, this is why things are the way they are, instead of leaving it a mystery? Well, this is one thing I feel as a fan of zombie movies and zombie lore and uh, in terms of the, of the zombie story, I always know there's never a clear cut, for most cases, you never really know the origin of the pathogen or the virus. Uh, it's almost left to the reader to just fathom what they, what they believe, I guess. In some ways, to tackle it, but most of the time, it's, it's ambiguous. You don't know where it comes from. And I wanted to hit out right in the gate where it sort of came from, but at the same time, we a lot of stuff unanswered. But of course, through the course of the comment, they will be answered. But I just felt saying off the back, it was viral, it hit military installations, so it almost seems calculated. Yeah, there still could be a lot of answers that are yet to come, but I, I did this in a way to also establish the main character and how he's a Delta soldier, special ops, and that he's immune because while his base is being attacked, or they're getting hit with the virus, he's actually being injected with nanobots that are kind of infused with his cell structure to keep him alive. And, and some of his abilities that you don't know, but in terms of surviving, why is he surviving? Because I know people might be saying, how come he's still alive? Well, that's why I, I just orchestrated it in that way, but I felt providing readers with a sense of where the, the virus started would be a good way to, to let them know that in Under the Flesh, you will get a resolution. You will know where this virus came from. You're not gonna, we're not going to go 10 years, 20 issues, 100 issues, and you still where did this virus come from? No, we're, we're eventually going to get to a finality and a resolution on that. That is the promise. So, do you, do you have an end game in mind for Under the Flesh? Um, I wish I could say I did. I could tell you I have a blueprint fully written. I have a plan and a direction. Now, as far as how long it goes, it determines on the reception. So far, I put it out online as a webcomic uh, to test the waters, to test the water, so to speak. And as a webcomic, promoting it myself, uh, we've successfully seen the comic within a month's time frame, I guess. We've seen it rise to the top 50 and the top six list and the top 100. I, mean, I know there's a comic, uh, but at the same time, we'll take time, and the more content we put out, I know the more... The reception will grow. We're the, 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 the fan base will grow. A lot of web comics they'll debut with forty pages worth of stuff. We debuted with only six pages, and we're up to page twelve now. We update one page a week, and I'd like to double that, even triple that. But we're doing it at a slow pace just to try to grab readers, just to see what we, you know, what we can, what we can manage. But at the same time, I, I would like to push this, not milk it, I guess, but at the same time, give the readers something good and something that they'll enjoy and something that. Uh, that they can really cling to. Uh, I don't want to say that, I mean, I know there's a lot of people that believe the zombie genre is dead and it's been, you know, done to death, but I get that. It's very reasonable to feel that way with all the stuff we've seen turned out in, in relationship to zombies. But I feel that there's 
done right, we can still provide something fresh for all those undead aficionados out there. If Batman can stay relevant after 75 years, why can't zombies, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I personally feel like there's still a lot of gas left in the tank. Uh, you, you're seeing a lot of original takes on it, you know? You've gotten uh, Warm Bodies. Have you ever seen Warm Bodies? Yes, 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 Warm Bodies, okay. They portray them as actually having thoughts, which is kind of a first, you know? I mean, people don't realize that Romero kind of touched on that stuff in his earlier films, too. The zombies yeah, I mean, still retaining some intelligence. I mean, um, I know there's a stereotype with zombies, they're all dumb, they're all dead, or so I kind of admire it, it's dead how he has this kind of unseen, determined intelligence factor there, and love with the gun at the end, I mean, I love that. So I, I can get behind it, but I think if you do it in a way that adds credibility, I mean, readers can get behind it. And the zombie genre, there's still room for, for freshness, and... As you see with Under the Flesh, I don't want to call them zombies just because they're not typically zombies, but we can call them zombies, I guess, for now. But there will be some differences between the traditional zombie compared to what you see in Under the Flesh only because they're infected and not necessarily undead. So we have a lot. It's almost like, I'm not sure if you've read uh, Garth Dennis's Cross, but it's kind of that kind of savagery, that kind of primal rage so they're men but they're not men right. they're feral you know and I think doing that you could kind of bring both worlds into play and people that love zombies will automatically agree with, uh, with the ideas in uh, Under the Flesh yeah I had noticed from reading Under the Flesh that Zombies is definitely a loose term for the, the description of your infected. Your zombies, or your infected, as I'm going to take to calling them now, they <laughs> they've kind of have a pack mentality almost. You mentioned that whole of them tasting women's flesh in a different way. I wonder if, like, if now if maybe you've got some ideas of, like, zombie babies and stuff, which would be totally creeptastic. That's touching on that, that primal instinct where I feel it's kind of funny because it's kind of... I guess I don't want to say it's funny because obviously there's an element of real horror to that, thinking of a woman there being raped by this one of these, I guess you could say, infected males in that way. But it does open the possibility to, like what you said, maybe babies or something. But I feel it's a way that could add a different dynamic to the narrative of Under the Flesh, but also, like, it also seems credible because we're painting a picture, we're, we're, we're show, showing that they do have a pack mentality. And they do intercommunicate like animals, like wolves. You know, these are men. So, in some ways, like just your dog and he will just want to run up to you, and you know, you have some of these infected and under the flesh. We'll we'll do that. Um, so we're we're gonna we're touching into that, but eventually it will all be uh, explained clearly. But I think it adds a new level to, to the horror. I mean, and when you factor that it's a, you know, a virus that only infects males, there's a reason for that as well. Definitely a, a different take uh, for anyone that hasn't checked it out. Now, what made you decide to go um, with digital? I mean, obviously, it was probably easier, more control for you, but what uh, um, honest, uh-huh. What made you decide to go in that direction of the releasing six pages and then doing a page to two pages every week versus just waiting and doing, like, a, a graphic novel or just complete issues every couple of months? The publishing world is...
and I believe the story is really comes a lot because you're mixing words with visual impact and creating story in peanut butter and it's the symphony. When you have beautiful words, a good story with beautiful art, uh, I believe that will cement a reputation better than just not doing anything or just trying to pitch it blindly. So I, I, I chose the six pages, bring it to the digital medium and online for free for everybody. And eventually, uh, if we get uh, the following is there, we can try uh, maybe crowdfunding like a Kickstarter. We do have a Patreon page that we built up. The Patreon is sort of like a Kickstarter. It's a crowdfunding platform where fans will, 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 could support creators in, 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 their, in their work. Um, of course, this is entirely, you know, optional. The support is optional. Um, it will always be free online. But it's a way where readers, if they want to see maybe up to two pages a week, up to, it's just a way for them to contribute and they get cool rewards, cool exclusives that will only be found on Patreon. So we're, we're tapping into different, into different avenues. When we do reach 22 pages, I feel maybe there's a chance we could try pitching it to uh, an image, a dark horse, an IDW, see where that gets us. Uh, if not, it, it's there online where I'm putting out pages. And I have a great artist, uh, J.L. Giles, is uh, a maestro. This dude inks, this dude letters, this dude colors the page, and this dude reads the script and puts my ideas into beautiful art, gripping, captivating art. And luckily with, with him, we're, we're a force in, in bringing comics to life. And I feel me and him are definitely on the road to bringing under the flesh to readers in a way that could expand. And if, if, uh, if, if it grows, it grows. If it's going to be on uh, comic book shelves, it would be a dream of mine, you know? <laughs> and we're just taking it little by little. So, since you've gone digital, how do you feel about digital versus print? I know we talked about this a little bit before the interview. I kind of wanted to save it for now. I kind of, I'm kind of old school, I guess. I'm, I'm not that old. I don't want to say I'm old. I'm kind of still in my early 30s, okay? I don't want to say I'm old. But I'm, I, I still like to feel a paper, and I still like to turn a page, and I still like to smell a comic book. I don't know if that sounds weird. I do respect the digital medium and that it's easy to get the comic out there. To readers, and I can't deny. As long as always believes you know, hold it in my hand at some point, there is the time. Keep it strictly digital, but maybe for the hardcore, if they want to have the ability to purchase a volume or an issue and have it in a physical copy, I believe it should stay. I mean, I like digital, and I'm kind of scared. We're all scared for change, but I believe going digital is good because it could reach a wider audience if done correctly. And, uh, and it keeps production costs down, which is really good for publishers and even independent creators like myself. It, it kind of helps. As a comic fan, how do you feel about the New 52 and their attempts to bring in new readers? Honestly, I feel it's confusing. See, the thing with DC and Marvel, these publishers have a library of awesome heroes and I feel creating all these alternate universes, it, it, it makes it harder for new readers to jump in and kind of know what's going on when you have hardcore fans as well, not adjusting to, uh, to the big move. So in, in a sense, I, I feel like innovation is needed for both DC, for both Marvel. It's almost like I feel you have Superman for how many years? You have Batman for how many years? I'm talking about since the 30s, you can't have Superman since, since the 40s, Batman, right? I mean, you have these guys for years, and you've established different dynamics within them, and it works. But I feel we can create a new sort of superhero for for, for the new generation, diversify the comics in a way with, want to keep it with Superman or whatnot, with the older, with the older icons, or you still have a position to bring in new characters and mix them, intermingle them with the DC universe with, with Batman, and I feel that's something that should be done. Um, so, I mean, there's still a lot of originality, there's still a lot of creativity left. I just, I mean, I hate to see the reboots after reboots after reboots. As much as I love Spider-Man, <laughs> you know, I mean, you can only do it to a point where it becomes where you're not creating something new. Back before Spider-Man, who was Spider-Man? You had to create Spider-Man to get Spider-Man, and we love him, and we're always in a low. But I feel we can use the creativity of these new creators in the, in the comic and bring new characters out and have them 
interact with the characters of old, but then you establish a new set of characters for the new generation, the new specific heroes. So comics has a lot of breathing room, is it the matter of I absolutely agree. One of the things I really like about uh, DC, man, I, I, as a fan, I've been reading comic books since I was a little kid. I'm in my uh, late 30s now. Um, there's, As you know, being in your 30s yourself, there's been tremendous change since you were a kid. Uh, this one's been a little hard to swallow. Marvel, though, by incorporating... Uh, I think they're doing brilliantly by incorporating characters from movies into the comics. I'm not that's sure good, I'm... That's good. I'm a believer in this new fan base, but I, it's a possibility that exists. Like you were, we were talking on the phone before we started the interview. You were saying, you know, you were excited about Guardians of the Galaxy and you know all these movies bringing up new fans. Do you think that all these comic book movies that are coming out now are transitioning into new fans into the comic book stores? Hmm. I mean, in a way, I'd like to say yes, only because. If you see the numbers, uh, a new movie comes out on opening day, box office, so I think the numbers are there. But the fan base is what brings the numbers in. Now, if we're creating new I mean, time will tell. I mean, I'd like to think so, yes. I'd like to think that at the same time, people that don't know Guardians of the Galaxy, maybe will go in because they be doing a voice there or they believe that people in the movie, they watch the movie, and they can get hooked. And it could bring a new fan base. We could take it to new directions. I want to say that. But at the same time, it might just be rehashing. And it might just be where the same fans are just going to support the same thing. And we're still not getting new fans into it. So but honestly, I feel that it will bring new fans. Because if you think Disney want Marvel, they bought them for a reason. And if Disney knows how to, you know, at the same time, I don't agree a lot with what they're doing. At the same time, new readers, I believe, is the emphasis there to bring new readers in, and I'd like to believe, yes. Uh, you would like to think so. And you know, as a fan, uh, obviously you're a fan, you would hope to see our industry flourish. Oh, for sure, definitely. Because the, the day that there's not a comic book, that's going to be a sad day, but I don't think it's a day we're ever going to see. <laughs> no, that's the day I hope I'd be past my, my apartment, but I wouldn't even be here because just a comic I mean, it's American culture. And at the same time, it's transcended, I mean, to, to, to movies, to TV shows, and it's created all those universes that, that like, look at look at The Walking Dead. I mean, Kirkman did a great job. It came to AMC, and AMC puts their spin on it, and they create, you know, Daryl, a, a character that's just on the show, and people just flat out love him. So you have a ton of Walking Dead fans that never even knew the comic existed. So, I mean, I believe that it's going to be hard to phase out comments, but at the same time, I hope that it's not diluted. I just hope that they, they keep the, the integrity of uh, there and it become a cash down. But behind everything, I mean, at the same time, you don't want to dilute it. That's all I'm saying. I just that you want to keep it going, and I would hate to see, like you said, if they were comments on, on it popular. Yeah, it's, it's, I feel like since we were kids, you've already seen a decrease in popularity. We've already lost the spinner racks, which were a big part of my, you know, I, there was nothing I, I loved more than hitting the 7-Eleven when I was 9 and 10 years old and grabbing a Slurpee and a few issues of, you know, Spider-Man or Batman off of the rack, so it's not in the yeah, same I, environment. Uh, but like you were saying with digital and all these kids with iPads, maybe, you know, maybe there's hope. You see, I mean, you bring up the spinner rack, and I, I, I can tell you that Sundays was a big day for me growing up. I mean, was it to go to church, Mom, don't get mad. Uh, at that time, it was for when I got out of church because we'd stop at the shop, uh, and there would always be a spinner rack there, and I would always grab a new issue of Spider-Man. Every Wednesday, I go to my local comic shop, and it's just a, it's a good place to be. <laughs> you get into a good conversation, you pick up a couple comics, and, and it's just a, it's a culture that I don't want to see lost because everyone is going digital, digital. I got my iPad here, download the next comic, no need to step out the house. But it's something that, it's, it's, it's a reality, that's this thing, it's part of change, it's part of how technology rolls. Yeah, it, it certainly feels like that humanity is becoming a little less social, even though <laughs> claims all this social networking through computers. Yeah, yeah going exactly. to the comic book store is an experience. I've explained it to other people. It's not solely about the comics books, but it's the experience of going to the store, purchasing them, you know, having discussions, like you were saying, with other fans. It's Yeah. 
it's a beautiful it's, it's a beautiful world we live in. <laughs> it's, it's interaction, but now everything is digital interaction. Like you said, with social media, it seems to be uh, the next thing, and, it, it, and it's almost like the elements that interactivity uh, in the comic shop when we like to talk about discussions, superhero battles, or you know, just those those, those engaging topics of about movies. It's good to do it at a personal level and, and not tweeting it and not liking Facebook comments about the movie, which is cool as well, but it's just like you said, it's, it's the direction of technology better than crazy was being that's so sad. <laughs> So, right before I let you go here, I want to ask you, what are you currently yep. reading? What are your current favorite comic books? Okay, I will give you a couple off the back. I'm always going to love Spider-Man. Batman's always a favorite. But I have a big, big spot for independence, for any comics. I'm reading right now, Ghosted by Joshua Williamson, uh, Dead Body Road, uh, Justin Jordan, love what he's doing. Um, yeah, Manifest Destiny as well is definitely a one that's following uh, Sketch Criminals. <laughs> Definitely uh, like what Fraction's doing there. And I kind of like the independence a little bit more. I mean, I, I have Walking Dead, of course, but following that, I mean, might be, that's definitely one I'm still following. I like what they're doing there. I don't want to see, I, I don't want to see it become stagnant, but I mean, I want to see something that's going to blow my mind. And I know Kirkman got that all up the sleeve, and uh, that's what got me gripped in the first place. But Walking Dead, definitely something I'm following. I like the new Bush Rider by Chad Moore. I want to see the deal with that. And that's a, a little bit off the top of my head. All those comics are good. Ghosted, man. I've, I've read. I love Ghosted. I've heard great things about sex criminals. Uh, <laughs> big fan of The Walking Dead. Yeah, wa sex criminals. Sounds completely different. I, I haven't gotten around to reading it yet, but uh, the independent world definitely has a lot to offer nowadays. Uh, it's a great thing because things can get boring when it's just Batman, Superman, yeah, and works. the Avengers, you know. I mean, you can only do Batman so many times, and it works. Because, I mean, his character, you can think of so many ways, I get it, but we kind of know Batman, so we kind of something to give him Batman, and maybe then we can have a little... But when you deal with independence, you can think more to it. my inner fanboy to wear instead of being overly critical of everything that comes out now I embrace it I'm happy to be yeah. getting a Flash show I'm happy we're getting Preacher I'm happy we're getting Constantine you know these yeah, men they, awesome. they, they definitely get some good stuff I'm glad for that it's definitely some good stuff and good or bad I'm glad we're getting it you know um, earlier we talked a little about Michael Bay that was on the phone before the interview <laughs> I know I've got uh, my usual co-host is not with us today He's a huge Turtles uh, fan. I mean, he's got Turtles inked into his flesh. He is a fan. And uh, I know a lot of people are concerned. I Michael Bay fan. Yeah, yeah, I think I everyone's mean, concerned about I Bay. For sure. Blood. I know a lot of the Transformers fanboys, they hate Michael Bay. They feel like, you know, Michael Bay raped my childhood, which is just insane. Um, Transformers was, I, 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 like I said, I admire Michael Bay because he was in a position where he had a lot of influence with uh, the cartoon of my childhood, and he, he, he made me the magic wand. Whatever he wanted to happen, happen. But at the same time, I give him a respect only because he was in a position I would dream of being. And I know there comes a lot of pressure with that, and you don't want to see him being too much of a dick, I guess, in ruining our childhood. But I, I kind of like Transformers 1, I'll say that. Transformers 2, you lost me, it hurt. I was, I uh, mean, pulling out my nails, it was bad. Part 3 had some hope, but I was at the end, and it fell flat for me. And I saw the trailer of the fourth one, and I want to say that maybe he kind of 
Michael Bates seems to, I don't know if I'm saying getting on the right track, but I think he knows what he has to do. It's like, for the respect, you know, for, for getting our, for getting our respect. Let's hope he doesn't crap it out with turtles. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hope not. I hope not. I would hope not. There's a lot of potential there with the turtles, man. And like I said, it's worth it. Different forms, we're seeing them in the Nick Bogey tunes. We're seeing them with the IDW comics. We're seeing them in the CGI film. Now we're seeing a totally new live action film, 2014 Turtles this summer. So, I mean, these guys that created the Turtles, it, it, there's something special there. And it, it, it could work and it could keep on going. But I just pray that Michael Bay, that Michael Bay it up. Wrapping this up, man, have you got anything uh, coming up here outside of Under the Flesh? Any new projects you're working on? Under the Flesh will be top right now. I have other bevy of projects that are in the mix that are just looking for talented artists to bring them to life. And that's part of the search of bringing collaboration into being. So hopefully Under the Flesh could open the door where it might make my ability to find an artist much, <laughs> much easier. But... If you like my creativity with Under the Flesh, you kind of like what I'm trying to do, and I guess giving the zombie genre a fresh little take, you're going to love a lot of the other products that are coming out. And then everyone can check that out at uh, undertheflesh.com, correct? Yes, sir, undertheflesh.com. We update every Sunday with a new page, which we'll be doing tomorrow. Guys, check it out. If you dig horror, if you dig post-apocalyptic scenario, carnage, violence, badass chicks, because we got a virus that only affects us, so trust me, prophecy. Yeah, just come by and check it out. If you get hard, you're gonna like Under the Flesh. Excellent. I'm enjoying it, man. The the page a week is killing me. It's, <laughs> but, it, but I'm enjoying what you're what you're putting out so far, man. Um, I gotta yeah, say uh, uh-huh. a big thank for being on the show, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks uh, for you, having me, bud. Big big shout. Thank you, guys. It's been a laugh. Thanks for the for the opportunity. And as always, you can get everything we do at comicsremix.com, spinnerack.podbean.com, or check us out on iTunes. Again, big thanks to Gilbert Deltrice for joining us today, creator of Under the Flesh. Check it out. Good stuff, man. Thanks, man. Thanks, Brian. Check it out. If you like horror, like post-apocalyptic savagery, stop on by. Absolutely, man. Thanks again, sir. You have a good day. Everybody else, we'll see you back here next week on Spinnerack. Peace. Mm-hmm.